Oh, howdy all, grab yourself a beer, it's time for some Path of Exile discussion. Today, GGG revealed an FAQ on some of the new mechanics being added into the uh, upcoming Echoes of the Atlas expansion. Uh, so I want to go through that. There are also two other pieces of news that I'll cover quickly. Uh, the first one is that Twitch streamer Zizarin is running a phenomenal uh, race event. If you like hardcore solo self found, uh, this is something for you. Uh, the He's organized a prize pool of 40,000 US dollars and that's going to be going in primarily to the first 25 people to kill the new boss, the Maven, in Hardcore Solo Self Found. Uh, so that's something that would be really exciting to watch as well uh, if you're not keen on playing H uh, HC SSF yourself. Uh, and I'll put a link down in the description of the video below. And likewise, second piece of news is that I'm setting up a Discord server. Uh, so if you want to get an invite to that, that'll also be in the description. But the news you came here for is the FAQ and the Q&A. So let's talk through that. So the first question that's been asked is related to the Maven and her challenges. Uh, how does the Maven's gameplay progression work? Does it occur alongside the Cirrus Watchstone progression? Now, the short version of this is that it's separate, but takes about the same amount of time. So, and that you can work on them both simultaneously. So the Maven's progression is not tied to Cerus and Watchstone progression. After your first encounter with the Maven, you can call her to witness map boss kills using her beacon on the map device. Her presence will amp up the boss, make it more difficult. From time to time, you'll be invited to the Maven's arena to fight an escalating number of bosses in an arena, three, four, five, six, and 10, and the 10 boss fight is repeatable and can be farmed. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking of this as like, almost like um, the way that you do the labyrinth a few times. So you do the labyrinth as a uh, monster level 33, then 55, then 68, then 75, which can be farmed. I mean, you can farm the lower ones as well with the labyrinth, which you can't here, but you would only consider farming the 75 labyrinth in the current state of the game. And actually now there's a uh, level 83 version of the labyrinth as well, which can also be farmed. Uh, so there's some sort of uh, connection there. The difference though is that the Maven's Arena will be a short, sharp burst of content. Uh, it's going to be a fight that you'll win or lose probably within two minutes. So after the 10 boss fight, you may have the opportunity to fight the Maven herself. Now there's no clarification as to how that works. Uh, and we don't yet know how frequently you're going to be able to encounter the Maven if you put focus on it. One of the questions that I asked that wasn't answered was like once players have worked out all the mechanics, how many maps do you expect it to be from one Maven encounter to the next? Uh, that wasn't answered, so we're gonna have to figure that out ourselves. The progression is on a per region bonus, so per Octon of the Atlas, uh, with each successful fight in the Maven's Arena awarding two passive points which can be allocated to the Atlas tree for that region. So essentially, uh, these fights are going to turbocharge a region of the Atlas that you're working on. The way that I see this is that while you are working on getting all of your Watchstones, you'll probably also be doing the Maven content at the same time. So there'll be more things to do at once, uh, but this is not going to cause it to take much longer uh, than it does at the moment. How do progression and rewards work for the Maven in party play? Uh, if you invite the Maven to witness a boss fight and complete that fight with other members of your party, they will also be counted as having completed that fight. Uh, so this is both good and also has a possible griefing potential if some bosses are extraordinarily brutal in the Maven's arena. So for instance, uh, you may, for instance, definitely not want to have the Vile Temple boss captured. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. You can also take on the bosses simultaneously with a party, uh, but the success of that fight is awarded solely to the instance owner. Okay, so think of this as being uh, a better system than we have for the Conquerors of the Atlas. With Conquerors of the Atlas, if I'm mapping with my friend Alice, uh, and Alice is going through, uh, and you know, we're running from Al Alice's Atlas device, I am making absolutely no progress towards my next Conqueror encounter, even if we're at the same spot in progression. With this system, uh, Alice and I map together, then each of us earns our own Ma uh, Maven Arena en Encounter Invitation. Uh, we then run those individually. So it's a much better party play system than Conquerors of the Atlas. How exactly are bosses captured for use in the Maven's Challenge? Uh, when you enter a map, you can click the Maven's beacon on the map device to summon her to witness your fight. Uh, if you're successful, the boss will automatically be counted as witnessed. Once the Maven has witnessed enough boss fights in that region, an item will drop that enables you to to travel to her arena to fight those bosses again. 
The Maven seems like an expansion to Cirrus and Conqueror's Endgame in a similar fashion to how the Elder was an expansion to the Shaper Endgame. Can we expect the Maven's story to be connected to the Cirrus arc or is this more independent? And from a storyline perspective, actually the Maven storyline is much more of a continuation of the Elder storyline. Uh, Cirrus is important to that indirectly because Cirrus was the one that killed the Elder, uh, at least in the current, uh, in the current um, sort of uh, timeline of the game. So if you're playing the game between 3.1 and 3.8, you were the person, your exile was the character that defeated the Elder uh, and you know sealed him away in the Uber Elder encounter. However, uh, the current state of play is that it's actually Cirrus that was the leader of that band of exiles. And in fact, Cirrus and his exiles were your characters from 3.1 through 3.8. That's the law behind it. And the Maven has just noticed that the Elder has gone missing and has come to investigate. How will boss fights be scaled in difficulty within the Maven's arena fights? So the first uh, invitations are quest items to progress through the increasing number of bosses you're fighting in her arena. After you've first completed the 10 boss fight, you'll have the chance to receive invitation items which can have mods and are craftable, enabling you to scale the difficulty of that fight. You cannot have duplicates of the same boss in the Maven arena, and the bosses are scaled to a fixed monster level based upon the number you're fighting at once. Now, so that means the bosses being scaled to a fixed monster level means that even if you have a sealed, uh, let's say that tier 14, let's say that the uh, boss of the plateau map is Oh, let's say that Plateau is a tier 14, it is a four watchstone version of Plateau. Uh, you, if you capture the boss of the Plateau, you will wind up with a, you'll wind up with a tier 16 version of that encounter. Uh, and that just basically means that they'll have 30% more hit points and 10% more damage or so, and one or 2% more action speed. That's the difference between tier 14 and tier 16. You won't be able to bottle up bosses uh, below four watchstone versions, I don't believe. But, the key thing here that's mentioned as a sort of a throwaway line, you cannot have duplicates of the same boss in the Maven arena. This is going to absolutely transform endgame farming. The reason for this is that it is a massive incentive to diversify the maps that you're playing within a given region. So let's say Glenark Cairns has the beach map. I don't know if that's the case or not. And let's say that it is by far the best layout in, in Glenark Cairns. Uh, you're going to have to make a choice. Do you focus the favourite map system on beach to prioritise beach drops, uh, but then in doing so not get enough other maps from Glenark Cans to smoothly run uh, the 10 boss, uh, 10 boss fight uh, as often as you could? Or do you just focus on, uh, do you focus on running a variety of maps, don't even use the preferred map system possibly, uh, and encounter lots of different boss, uh, in lots of different um, bosses there that you can then bottle up for the maven i think that the correct way to do this is going to be to pick a couple of maps that you pretty much never run uh, these will be things like core that have very very difficult uh, bosses or it'll be bosses with powerful area control effects so i'm thinking things like arakali here from the sunken city map uh, arakali has an area control effect that is going to be very difficult to navigate in the maven's arena so these sorts of mechanics, uh, you are not going to want to run these maps very often. Uh, likewise, you'll have maps like uh, the Dark Forest map comes to mind as well. Another boss that is really difficult, uh, has a couple of mechanics that just do not play well with other things happening in the arena. So you're going to skip those maps, but you're then going to run pretty much everything else in that octant. Maybe there'll be a couple of tile sets like Dungeon where you think the boss is fine, but you just don't want to run the map. Uh, but other than that, you're just going to be running everything. I'm looking forward to this, this meta of diversification of maps that we're running. And it's probably the single thing that's uh, one of the most important answers in this FAQ, even though it's sort of hidden. Yesterday's reveal mentioned that the Maven is the first of the Eldritch entities. Is this plan to be an expandable system? Uh, and essentially, this is GGG just not giving an answer to that. Can the Maven witness unique map bosses? No. Uh, this is probably a good idea because uh, there are a couple of unique map bosses, like the one, uh, like the uh, Strand map that has a name that I can't pronounce, uh, that have absolutely ridiculous and awful mechanics. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of glad they've made this decision. 
Does the tier of the map boss affect the captured boss? Like how watchstones alter the tier of maps. The Maven's challenges have fixed monster levels, so the tier of the map doesn't directly affect the uh, the tier of the map boss when you fight it again. Uh, but harder Maven challenges do require that you capture bosses in higher tier maps, though. How will bosses with more complex attacks, such as the Rigwald's Wolf Barrage, Shock and Horror's Lightning Tether Beam, Conley the Unrepentance uh, channeling of spawning monsters and things, and the uh, Conley the Unrepentant also has the Innocence uh, Bullet Hell attack? How will these function in the arena? And this is one of the questions I asked on Reddit. Uh, boss skills that are usually tied to that boss's arena have generally been adjusted to make sense in the context of the Maven's challenges rather than being removed entirely. Exactly how this was done was done on a case-by-case -case basis. So uh, it'll be really interesting to see how these uh, break line of sight or die mechanics like uh, Rigwald's Wolf Barrage, uh, it's, not, it's not strictly break line of sight, you can run in really close and circle him circle kite him really closely but it's uh it's pretty close to uh break line of sight or die uh and i've we saw shock and horrors uh shock and horrors lightning tether beam doesn't seem to be able to move as quickly as it does in the uh in the normal boss encounter with shock and horror with her uh but it is things like conley the unrepentance uh innocence uh bullet hell explosion these are going to be really interesting to see what exactly they do with those uh, i would suggest being very 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 cautious uh in hardcore especially uh with these maven encounters for that reason uh how does maven interact with twin maps upon defeating both copies of the boss the maven will add one copy to her challenge so that's the the most favorable way imaginable given that you can't have duplicates of a boss can we instruct the Maven to witness boss fights on maps occupied by Elder Guardians? Yes, we can. So if you've ever wanted to get murdered by the Eradicator, the Purifier, uh, the Enslaver, and the, uh, what's the other one called? I always forget their names. Uh, Constrictor. All at once, then be my guest. Uh, of course, we'll all... We'll all be laughing at you when we see the video of you getting slaughtered by those four. Uh, those four together would be absolutely brutal because each of them has powerful area control effects uh, and they will not play nicely with each other. What happens if you die in the Maven's Challenge? Can you re-enter the arena? Uh, yes, you can. It's basically a map. Uh, so it's six portals. Uh, so it is more like failing a normal boss fight than it is, say, failing an incursion. Atlas passive trees. Are trees specific to each region of the atlas? Yes. Uh, the, uh, the only difference, the only clarification that they make is that atlas respect points, which come from an orb, are not region specific. At what stage will we unlock our atlas regions? Around Awakener's level 8 or question mark? Uh, Awakener level 8 is a good estimate for when you will be able to unlock all passives in all regions. You'll be able to unlock a full region tree for a single region well before that. So I'm kind of thinking of this as being essentially uh, the the five encounters that you've got for the Maven uh, in, in an Octane will be sort of like just getting four Watchstones from that region. That's the sense that I get. Uh, I think that you will be able to do... Uh, like, assuming that you're not having to slow down your progress because monster encounters are too difficult or something like that, uh, if you're able to make smooth progress, I expect that you'll probably need to run maybe... 30 maps in each octant to get everything, uh, which is a little bit more than it tends to take to get Awaken a level 8 in my experience. Uh, so yeah, depending upon how, um, depending, well, it's 30 maps in the, 30 maps in the, in the outer four and 20 in the inner four is usually what it takes me to get Awaken a level 8. So I think it might be slightly slower. That's, that's my feeling. But anyways, we're just gonna have to see. Uh, with Atlas passive trees being specific to each region, does this mean that, for example, you'd only find Beyond in the Lex Proxima tree and no other? Uh, each Atlas tree is unique, however, some mechanics appear in multiple regions trees. So this means that there'll be specific Beyond buffs in Lex Proxima and possibly a different Beyond buff in Veldo's Rest. Uh, but we're just going to have to wait and see. All of the Atlas passive trees will be revealed soon. Do the mechanics modified by Atlas passive trees still spawn randomly, or can they only spawn by using the trees? Uh, they still spawn randomly in any map at the same rates they used to. So this means that, for instance, uh, you will still have a 10% chance to get a blight in any given map, uh, but if you're in an octant that has augments to blight and you've, uh, you've decided to allocate those augments, then it might be instead of 10%, it might be 12%, it might be 14%. We're just going to have to find that out. 
One thing that I think that is going to come up with this is that uh, scarabs that can force certain mechanics onto certain maps will be very important to use in the right octants. Uh, but again, we're just going to have to wait and see all the details. Our designer's map crafting device options still exist. Yes, they work as they always have, and the set of Zana mods available during 3.13 will be revealed this week. So that'll be interesting to see. I think one of the massive questions will be, will the Delirium Mirror still be able to be spawned for 16 Chaos? Uh, I would really love to see the Delirium Mirror set at a, diff at a price point that uses a different currency item. Uh, something like, um, I think what would be really interesting actually would be having it set at four Blessed Orbs. Blessed Orbs are surprisingly rare, uh, although very, very, very cheap in trade leagues in recent times, uh, but they are pretty rare drops. And that'd be something to be quite interesting to see as suddenly a currency orb that is really worthless would, would end up being in hot demand. Uh, so I'd be interested in seeing that. Or also you could have um, something like uh, Parandus available for three regal orbs would be another thing. But anyways, uh, that's that's getting out of FAQ and what's actually happening and into what I would like to have happen. Um, so this seems like a substantial step up in complexity with craftable watchstones and atlas passive trees alongside the current watchstone progression systems. How do you feel average or newer players handle the current atlas and will handle this? And the key answer here is basically by the time you get to this, we think you'll be fine with it, uh, which I think seems actually right. Craftable Watchstones are optional content that do not lock your progression and are introduced well into endgame. So I'm working under the assumption, I could very well be wrong here, that the Craftable Watchstones will drop uh, from the 10 boss fights. That's my expectation here. Uh, and so in order to get the 10 Watchstone fights, you're going to need to have four, uh, four Watchstones in that area anyway. Uh, not necessarily that you've actually earned all four of them from that region. That's my guess. Um, I could very well be wrong. Players that want to maximize their watchstone bonuses will have a reasonable understanding of the mechanic by the time craftable variants are introduced. Uh, I agree with that. You'll, um, you know, you may not know all of the nuances, but you'll certainly have the basics down pat before you see your first craftable watchstone. Uh, both Atlas passive trees and craftable watchstones are prominent features that don't require continual upkeep or time investment. And can I just say, this is a huge improvement over scarabs. Um, scarabs require continual upkeep, continual time investment, uh, whereas this is just basically none of that. How do you obtain Atlas respec points? A new currency item will grant them. Uh, this item will drop randomly, but there are also more deterministic methods of obtaining them, which you may discover while playing. So what I'm thinking this is gonna be is that uh, there'll be a very, very rare uh, drop that will, you know, world drop that can be an Atlas respec point, uh, but there will also be some vendor recipe for them. That's, that's me reading between the lines here. So essentially that will put some sort of price cap on how expensive they can be. So let's say it might be something like, you know, vendor 10 regal orbs to get one Atlas respec point. Uh, that would be a deterministic way of acquiring them, uh, whilst you can also have it drop randomly anywhere. But I'm only purely speculating with that vendor, you know, vendoring 10 regals is just me entirely guessing. How hard is it to respec the Atlas passive trees? Is it something players would need to adjust often or leave intact most of the time? Uh, and essentially, how often you want to change your passives is up to the player and what they determine to be profitable. I think that the main thing early on will be people will very early on will just experiment with things to see what feels good. And as a result, there'll be a lot of respecking early in the first league. So in 3.13, there'll be a lot of early respecking of the Atlas points. Then after some time, uh, people will work out a general best approach. And I know that I'm intending to put out an Endgame Atlas guide probably pretty early into the new league. Uh, that will not cover any of the mechanics of how to get your watchstones, how to make your maven progress, uh, but that will just be how I'm setting up my atlas and what I think you should, you know, why I'm making the choices I'm making. Uh, that's certainly something I've got planned, but it may be the case that you may want to uh, set things up a little differently. One good example of this is that it's my opinion that the strong boxes wing uh, that's been revealed. There's a there's a strong box setting where there's four points to take that causes all strong boxes to be rare and corrupted. Now, this is a pretty strong uh, thing to have on your uh, on your atlas early in the league, but its power is going to fall off very quickly. The reason it's going to fall off quickly will be that once your league is flooded with jeweler's orbs, 
uh, then the value of corrupting strong boxes goes down a lot. Now, when I'm saying jeweler's odds, I'm talking about six socket drops uh, dropping there. Uh, you will find that uh, with the way that uh, Vald chess work, uh, Vald strong boxes, you'll get a very large number of six socket items and actually a meaningful number of six socket six link items as well. Uh, but if it's early in the league, uh, these will have some actual value to use in a trade league. Uh, and maybe even to use, uh, you know, maybe even there's something valuable that you'll loot that you'll use yourself. But then later on, uh, these will fall off in value really quickly. Uh, so for that reason, I think you might want to take that strong box wing early. Later in the league, though, uh, that competes with a lot of the incursions, uh, with the incursion uh, bonuses that are available in that Atlas Octon. And so at that point, you're going to want to go, oh, I'm going to now swap over and prioritize those, uh, those, um, those incursion ones, which are incredibly powerful. But... All of this will be something I'll discuss a lot more in detail when we get the full Atlas trees. And my initial thoughts then I'll discuss as well. In-game rewards, how can I track which watchstones and Atlas passive trees are affecting my maps? Uh, when you put a map into the map device, there'll be a pop-up which shows which stats are being applied to it by Atlas passive trees and watchstones. Uh, this is cool. This is going to be a necessity. Uh, one thing that's going to be really nasty in the new league, because there's so many of these little bonuses happening, uh, the list of map mods that comes up in the top right hand corner of the screen, uh, if you don't minimize it, is going to be completely useless. Uh, it's already been getting to the point that uh, it's sort of nothing fits on it, but it's going to be much worse now. Uh, so this is a good little change where you can see only those bonuses uh, from the map device and then you'll have the list of actual map mods that you can consult during the map if you really need to. Uh, is there a number, a limit to the number of craftable watchstones you can use at once? And essentially the answer is 32, four in each octant. Uh, note that each watchstone is linked to, is locked to a specific atlas region. So this will be indicated in the watchstone's name. So that was something that was made clear in the, uh, in the original introduction of these things, but uh, it's something that could easily have flown under the radar because there was so much information there. The idea behind this is to prevent optimal gameplay involving constant shuffling of watchstones around your atlas. Uh, at first I was thinking, why is it this locked to Lex Proxima? Uh, then when I, when I saw this line, it's like, yep, yeah, that's definitely the right call. Uh, no need to stuff around with swapping things all, all the time. Can I use multiple of the same type of craftable watchstone in the same region at once? Yes, and the effects of their mods will stack. Do craftable watchstones ever burn out? No. Are craftable watchstones tradable? Yes. Now, this is a big one. Uh, this is really significant because it means that you can apply sextants to them. And if you get one of the genuinely precious sextant rolls, you can trade it. You could already do this with the ivory watchstones, but they were fiddly. Uh, with these, you can use these permanent, uh, permanent watchstones forever. Uh, and this is going to be completely broken beyond belief uh, in conjunction with the Nemesis modifier, uh, Nemesis monsters drop three additional currency items, and the harvest uh, sextant uses uh, the map sextant uses are not uh, used together. That harvest enchant, which is almost certainly not going to be in the game in this league, but for standard players, uh, definitely you will be able to craft Nemesis monsters drop three additional currency items onto a craftable watchstone. Uh, and then use fractured fossils to duplicate your maps that have that har uh, that harvest enchant on them, and just do absolutely ridiculous things with them. Uh, do craftable watchstones contribute to awaken a level? Yes. However, you probably won't get many. Uh, can you find craftable watchstones before you get all your normal watchstones? Yes, but you probably won't. Uh, what items can the Maven Orb be used on? Uh, now we're getting into the Maven Orb at this point. Uh, any influence body armor, helmet, gloves, or boots with at least two influence modifiers. Now that's really interesting. Uh, I had not for a second thought that you couldn't use it on weapons. Uh, so you can't use them on weapons. Legacy modifiers or modifiers that can't be changed, e.g. suffixes on an item with suffixes cannot be changed mod, aren't valid. So I'm glad that they've thought this out. Uh, and I asked in the, um, in the FAQ question submission thread on Reddit, uh, I made certain to ask questions about uh, modifiers cannot be changed because in 3.9, when the Awakener Zorb went live, it, there were completely broken interactions uh, with the suffixes cannot be changed and prefixes cannot be changed mods. And essentially for the first week of the league, 
every single Meritier item that was crafted during the Metamorph League was crafted during the first week, and it was crafted by abusing the uh, prefixes cannot be changed mod in conjunction with the Awakener's Orb. Uh, so without going into the details of how that worked, I'm just glad that they've thought about it, they've uh, learnt from the mistakes that were made in 3.9, and they're not going to be made again. What mods exactly can the Maven's Orb upgrade? Can you upgrade any influence specific mod? A tier 3 mod will be replaced with a tier 2 version for example. If it selects a tier 1 version to upgrade, it will replace it with a new elevated mod that has even stronger effects. And I assume that we'll get all of these data mined at some point. How does the Maven's Orb interact with items that have multiple influence types? It doesn't distinguish between different influence types in any way. For example, if you use it on an item with three Shaper modifiers and three Redeemer mods, it will still pick one modifier to remove and one to upgrade at random. Can elevated mods be transferred with an Awakener's Orb? Yes. So this is the biggest piece of news here. Uh, this is a question a lot of people were asking because ultimately it was going to impact what the best thing you could possibly do with a Maven's Orb was. So this means that you can get whatever two elevated mods you want onto the same item with an Awakener's Orb. Uh, this is going to be really, really, really powerful uh, and it means that there will be a tremendous amount of Maven's Orb use going on in the new league. Uh, interestingly, on average, getting the elevated mod that you want, uh, getting a sort of setting up two items that have got the elevated mods that you want on them uh, as preparation to use an Awakener's Orb, will on average use four Maven's Orbs and only one Awakener's Orb. So that's going to create a strange, uh, strange setup where there's going to be a real imbalance in demand between these two orbs, especially in conjunction with the next question, roughly how rare is the Maven's Orb, similar to the Awakener's Orb. So I believe that the Awakener's Orb is 1 in 4 or 1 in 5 drop chance from Cirrus at Awakening level 8. So presumably the Maven will be uh, will have a 1 in 4 or 1 in 5 chance to drop the Maven's Orb. So with all of that in mind, uh, expect the Maven's Orb to be expensive. Uh, it's going to be used as an essential part of crafting the best items in the game and a lot of them will be used. Uh, if you get one and you don't know exactly what to do with it, I'd probably suggest actually selling it on to someone if you're in a trade league. Uh, because they're going to be, like, demand's going to be extraordinary and let other people with deeper pockets than you make the mistakes, uh, you know, while we're sort of learning how to use it. Uh, Ritual. Who gets the rewards in Ritual when playing in a party? Uh, the instance owner basically owns the rewards there. Uh, can party members view the favours window? Yes. Can you defer more than one Ritual item? Yes. Can you defer an item more than once? Yes. I kind of want to see these in practice before saying anything further. Is there an indicator in the favours window that displays when something has been deferred from a previous area? Yes. Uh, what happens when two or more people are in an area with a ritual and one of them is not in the ritual circle? Everyone needs to be within the ritual circle when it starts to participate in it. Now it's not clear whether you can start the ritual uh, just having some people locked out, uh, the stragglers, or whether they, uh, they prevent you from starting the ritual at all. Can you leave a ritual before the fight is over? You can portal out or close the game client. Can you fail at a ritual? If all players within the ritual die or have left, then it fails. You can come back and spend any tribute you did earn before it failed. Can you lose access to the rewards you've deferred? Uh, if a deferred reward comes up again in a later area, you should either purchase it or defer it again. If you don't defer it again, it doesn't vanish immediately, but it, its cost will increase. If you allow it to get it all the way back to its starting value, then it will disappear. Are we intended to pull monsters to the ritual sites? No, and you won't be rewarded for doing so. Do items from the favours window use the new high, high quality rare item generation system? Some of them will, but it depends on the type of item. Uh, there's a variety of stuff offered and a variety of different ways they do that. Uh, do the set of favours offered persist throughout an area or do they change between rituals? Uh, all items appear in the first favours window, but some are shrouded. The more expensive and advanced items will be unlocked after completing later rituals in an area. So essentially, uh, if you want to get the best items there, you're probably going to need to do all three rituals in a zone, or potentially all four as we'll get to later. Are there any ritual specific rewards such as new bases or uniques drop from monsters during rituals, or are they only tributes? Uh, they only come from tribute. Ritual vessels capture monsters from a ritual site to use in later maps. Is this instead of doing the ritual, or just afterwards with nothing lost? Uh, and it looks like you can, uh, it's just basically afterwards with nothing lost. Uh, do ritual vessels apply the captured mon monsters to all ritual sites in a new map? 
Can you then use a vessel to capture those again, plus the new monsters from the new map, stacking them again and again? And you can only use ritual vessels so, uh, in a map that does not have a vessel active on it. Uh, so are there numbers always three rituals per zone? Uh, no, it increases as you progress. Uh, current cap of four altars. Will there be any sextant mods related to rituals? No. Uh, that said, mods that increase the number of monsters in a map uh, will impact how many monsters you encounter in a ritual. How is the barrier around the ritual circle enforced? You cannot enter it or exit it, but it doesn't hurt you. Uh, one question that I did have that wasn't answered there uh, relates to how that barrier interacts with smoke mine or untargeted teleports like that. I'd like to know the answer to that, uh, but ultimately I would suggest that if there's a ritual you care about winning, that you don't smoke mine uh, from within from within side to, to attempt to cross that barrier. Ascendancy classes. Uh, what's happening to the Scion? Uh, it's getting reworked and we think she's in a good place now. Now I've said for a long time that the Scion has been being held down by the existence and the power level of the Unnatural Instinct Eunuch Jewel. Uh, the Scion can use Unnatural Instinct so much better than any other class. And this jewel, this very rare jewel, very powerful, very rare jewel, which I should actually uh, do a video on for the video that I, uh, video series I've been putting out about uh, in-game unique items. Uh, the Unnatural Instinct jewel is so incredibly powerful on a Scion that essentially the Scion has been balanced around its existence in recent times. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. If this, uh, so, if the Scion is in a good place now without Unnatural Instinct, then that means that Scions with Unnatural Instinct will be incredibly strong. So I have to keep an eye on that. How does Battle Mage interact with Spell Slinger? The damage from Battle Mage and Spell Slinger add together. So Battle Mage is a mechanic that uh, is on the Inquisitor tree at the moment, where the uh, where your weapon's base damage is added to the damage of spells that you fire. So what that means is that if you've got a Varlax that has the, uh, if you've got a Varlax and it has the mods Malicious, which is plus some percent, uh, some amount of flat chaos damage, and Cremating, which is some amount of flat fire damage, then all of your spells will gain the benefits of the Malicious mod, the Cremating mod, the, those extra damage, that extra flat damage, plus the base damage of the Varlax's physical as well. Uh, so this is a really interesting setup where it removes some of the tension in terms of how you gear a character that is trying to both attack and do damage with spells. Uh, we're going to have to see how this works in practice. But if you are using a wand and you have battle mage and you are using spell slinger, you're going to get double benefit from your weapon. This could be really interesting. One thing of note that uh, spell slinger and presumably battle mage as well do not have a good interaction with conditional increased damage. So what I'm talking about here is things like the Shaper mod, uh, add X to Y cold damage per 10 dexterity your character has, uh, that's flat out not going to work. How does the Primal Aegis skill on the Elementalist Bastion of Elements passive work? Uh, similarly to the existing Aegis skills, which are only available from memory on uh, a couple of unique items that drop in the unique Moon Temple map. Uh, when the Aegis is active, it absorbs incoming elemental damage from hits instead of you. Uh, the Aegis will be restored to full if it doesn't take elemental damage from hits for a short time. So this will be a considerable amount of protection from uh, cold, fire and lightning damage. It's also worth noting that recharge for all Aegis skills now can't be interrupted if they're completely depleted. The recharge time is 5 seconds on Primal Aegis, uh, which is different to the other Aegises. The amount of damage that Primal Aegis can absorb is based upon how many notable passives you have allocated. I think this is actually a really powerful defensive node. Now there's been, a, the way that it's currently worded, so this is the Elementalist node that grants you a degree, an ablative shield against elemental damage. Uh, this node is interesting in that it's, um, it uses the term notable. Now to me that means the normal passive tree. However, some people have said that Neon from GGG has stated that it's actually not the normal passive tree, it's the Ascendancy tree. So we're just going to have to see which of these it is. If it is Notables on the original passive tree, then this is a huge defensive node. It's going to provide an Ablative Shield blocking, you know, two or three thousand elemental damage, uh, which is just amazing. On the flip side, uh, if, I'm, if I'm wrong and it's uh, what people have reported to me that Neon says it is, uh, and it's only 800 points, then it's not nearly as significant. Let's just wait and see, but I think you're going to take that note for uh, Elemental Reflect Immunity anyway. 
Harvest. When does harvest content start? Maps. Uh, with the rework uh, removing the gardening side of things, how will the Ashabi questline and subsequent fight be assessed? Uh, occasionally, a portal to the Sacred Grove will contain the Ashabi fight. Her rewards are being reflect are rebalanced to reflect this change. How will I locate the pairs of harvests in the grove? They appear on the minimap. Heist. Uh, what's happening with split split base? Uh, essentially, split base will no longer duplicate all a coin investment in a blueprint. So you can still split based blueprints, but doing so will cause you to need a massive amount of coins to, uh, of, of rogue markers. So what I think this is going to mean in a trade league is that demand for rogue markers is going to be explosively higher than it's been in the heist league. Uh, we got to a point where the rogue markers were 500 to a chaos. Uh, then towards the end of the league, they got more like 120 to a chaos. Uh, I would not be surprised to see them be in the sort of 60 to a chaos range for the whole league, uh, but we're just going to have to find that out. That's that's speculation. We still get to use the high locker? Yes. Have you been able to solve the technical issues that forced the rogue harbor to become private? Yes. So you'll be able to see other players in the rogue harbor, which is not necessarily a buff. It's just it's just a bit of a change. GGG though, for GGG though, this is important because uh, they want to advertise microtransactions. One of the best ways to advertise microtransactions is to have other players uh, is to have you exposed to other players wearing them. So this was an important fix for GGG. For players, uh, it's probably not. The key issue wa with why the Rogue Harbor had to become a private instance was that the numbers of players there was just causing overwhelming. Uh, overwhelming lag on uh, you know when players were exposed to 50 million different microtransactions at once uh, if they've changed it so that there's only a couple dozen players in there at most then even on a lower end pc i think that should be fine miscellaneous will sarah stay in the game yes uh no change at the moment uh but it may be may be removed or changed in the future uh what are the redacted items in the new schedules the atlas passive trees and ascendancy class changes so the atlas passive trees info is coming up tomorrow ascendancy classes the day after can we get the background for the live stream as a wallpaper yes it will be available not yet does the resonance support on trinity have a cap yes it does and each element's resonance is capped at 50. this is quite a bit higher than people were speculating uh, and it means that i need to really give some thought to trinity support uh, I feel it might be an excellent support gem now, uh, but I'm not yet at a point where I can confidently state that that is true. I just think I think that for the moment. Uh, let's wait and see. How does Ignite work a scale when you have Black Flame equipped? So this is the ring that causes your uh, Ignites to deal chaos damage instead. Uh, so essentially, your Ignites will scale with your own fire and burning damage supports as usual, and not with chaos damage stats. However, the monster's damage taken will be scaled by chaos damage, affecting stats like chaos resistance and wither, uh, rather than by their fire resistance. This is really strong. Like I hadn't even thought of black flame and wither. Wither is a huge more multiplier for chaos damage, and I think black flame is going to be an incredibly powerful item as a result. Are elf testers eligible for prizes in league start competitions? No. Uh, as the expansion is boss driven, will there be a rebalance of experience and item drops for boss encounters? Uh, so the answer is no, uh, because I don't expect the fights to take more time. I think that item drops for bosses are in a great po position at the moment, but experience is just off the charts way too low for bosses. Uh, and I think, it's been my opinion for a while, that you should take about 30% of the XP that is currently given to magic monsters in a map and transfer that to the boss. Uh, that would be something that would actually make boss kills reflect the amount of time that they take. We ever implement the trade website in game? Um, not against our philosophy about trade. We'd like to do it at some point. From a tech perspective, this will take some time. Uh, do you have any thoughts on support characters? Uh, we like them basically, uh, so expect that there will be support. Char uh, there will be support for support characters in the in the future of the game. So I think here what they're asking is that there's a lot of concern amongst players that when they obliterate uh, aura stackers in the balance uh, in the balance manifesto, that this will obliterate the aura bot play style. Now, it's my opinion that aura bots were extremely strong even prior to the massive buffs that they got in Delirium. Uh, those buffs in Delirium were what enabled aura stackers to exist. Uh, so even reverting aura stackers back to the state that they were in before 3.9, uh, and an example of how you would do that would be outright removing the cluster jewel that grants 6% increased effectiveness of auras. 
uh, that medium cluster jewel. Uh, that would still leave Aura Stackers in a strong spot. But even if they did obliterate Aura Stackers, uh, like, uh, even if um, the changes that, whatever nerfs they have in mind for Aura Stackers, even if they did end up wrecking Aura Bots, uh, there's still other very strong types of support characters as well. Uh, curse support characters are really good too. Uh, they don't get played much because Aura supports are better, and most groups don't have two supports, uh, but curse support characters are still really, really strong as well. So, for that reason, I think there's... I have no concern that support characters will be unplayable in the, in any future state of the game. Um, are there going to be stash tabs for Heist, Harvest, and Ritual? There are no new stash tabs planned. Uh, will the new maps add 11 to the maximum Atlas completion bonus? Uh, it's actually 10 because Hogham is taking a retirement. Uh, can I just say that they should overhaul which maps are on the Atlas? There are so many unique maps... Uh, and there's no real rhyme nor reason to which ones are on the Atlas and which ones are not. So for instance, you have uh, some of the ones that were added as League specific drops like Parandus Manor, uh, Doriani's Machinarium are on the Atlas of Worlds. Some of the ones that are, were added as League specifics are not. So Cortex, uh, Rewritten Distant Memory, uh, the Beachhead, all of these are not on the Atlas. Then there's a bunch of the old classic unique maps that are all on the Atlas. Uh, I think it would be a great idea just for the just for a bit of a shake up to take six of the unique maps that are currently on the atlas and just give them a break from it and put six of the other maps on those those six unique maps. Let's say that you took uh, Mount Coon off the atlas. You took um, you took say um, oh let's take a couple of good ones and a couple of bad ones. So Hallowed Ground, Mount Coon, um, Maelstrom of Chaos, and the and say uh, Olmec Sacrum, take, take those off and add on two of the synthesis maps, add on the beachhead, add on something else. I think just varying these would be good. Uh, then some leagues, certain maps would matter more, some leagues they would matter less. But anyway, uh, that's getting back to my opinion rather than the FAQ. And this, was, uh, this video is meant to be about the FAQ first and foremost. So anyway, that's my thought and analysis on everything that came up in this uh, FAQ. Uh, there's a lot in it. Uh, there's definitely going to be more questions and comments, so far away below. I'm going to be joining Slippery Jim and Juicis and a couple of other people uh, talking about the upcoming league shortly, and we're going to possibly live stream that. Uh, that's still got to be decided. Uh, if I do live stream it, it may be on one of their channels. If that's the case, I will put a note to that effect on the uh, on my YouTube community tab. That's all I got though. Uh, have fun and I will see you in the next video.